Hello. We're back and I'm grabbing cough drops. <clears throat> back. Father, I thank you for those who will be coming into the study tonight. I ask you to be with us and I ask you to guide those who you have to be here. Prepare our hearts for the things that the, um, that you want to say to us today. And um, I ask you to keep our minds sharp. I ask you to touch my throat and clear it because of the allergens in the air. I've been <clears throat> doing that. So, Father, I ask you to clear my throat so that I can be able to function well and do a good job. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Gary, it's good to see you. We might have some new visitors here tonight. So we're in James chapter 5. We're in verse 7. Uh, I'm going to read the first six verses to catch us up so that if somebody comes in now, they can hear what we're going to talk about in context. Remember, there's two kinds of context when we do Bible study. There's the context of where something falls in an actual book or letter in the scriptures or in one of the Gospels. Um, and then there's, there's a, a topical context. And so there's the context, let's say, if we're talking about giving, or we're talking about serving, or we're talking about baptism, that the, the scripture says a lot about that. And you can't just take one verse and build the whole doctrine on the one verse. Well, I'll say that uh, people have done it, but I don't think it's biblically sound, and it's not that it's not biblically biblically doesn't have biblical integrity to do that. So, so it's important for us to have the context of where it find where we find it in a letter, and we also find it. Um, as a topic in the scriptures. So we are in, uh, so we can get the context of James's letter. We're in James 5, it says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth eaten, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. Oh, very lovely. You have heaped up treasure in the last days you've lived indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud those wages cry out and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury you have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter you have condemned you have murdered the just he does not resist you <clears throat> So that's where we got to last time. And then we got some into um, oh. Gary, could you hear any of that? Gary, can you hear me? Gary. Hey, Carol, are you here? Can you hear me? You can hear me? I had my mic down. Um, sorry about that. Um, it was giving me feedback the other day, so I turned it real low. And uh, I was listening to a video, and the music kept rotating. So... I forgot to fix that. Okay, so we're in we're in uh, James five seven. So now in verse seven he says this: Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. We talked a little bit about this last time, about how, how David waited to hear from the Lord. And, and, um, and he talked about how um, James, he was saying, be, be patient till the coming of the Lord. And I talked about how when I read through this and studied it, 
Um, I most of the commentaries refer to the coming of the Lord in terms of the final coming, the day when Jesus returns to rule and reign. But I didn't think this verse was referring to that. And the reason was because he uses the whole idea of regular patterns that God has built into, let's see, farming. He uses that in this example about how the farmer waits until the first rains and the last rains and the rains before um, planting or right around planting and the rains right before harvest to bump the harvest up. And so what he was talking about was a coming of the Lord that if you're in farming or ranching, you experience this as part of the way you survive. In fact, the whole world survives because of the coming of the Lord on a regular basis when it comes to causing the harvest. And I believe that a lot of us have prayed for God to accomplish something in our lives or to make something start or to make something stop. And it worked. And when that happened, that was a coming of the Lord, if you will, if that makes sense. Well, this advice fits in perfectly with other things that the word teaches on the subject of waiting. And so I'm going to paste some verses. Out of Psalm 37, we have this verse. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place. You look carefully, where was he? But it shall be no more, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And so that's a place in the scriptures that talks about waiting on the Lord. There's not one in Psalm 59. He says this. But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them, and you shall have all the nations in derision. I will wait for you, O you, his strength, for God is my defense. So God will have us wait for him to make a move sometimes. Then there's another one that I have actually have this hanging in our living room on a tapestry. And anybody who's been to our houses has had a chance to see it. And it's out of Isaiah 40. I always like when the scripture says, did you not know? Have you not heard? And it's because, you know, most of us haven't. It says this. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint, and the weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In these three Old Testament verses, the the word translated as wait are different Hebrew words, and they all have different nuances. However, they all hold one thing in common. They speak of trust in, and dependency upon the Lord. And that really 
if someone was to say, quick, define faith, that's what I would say. Trusting in the Lord. So here we have James writing to the scattered Hebrew Christians who are divide, who sent all over the Roman Empire because of persecution by their by their leaders as Jews. Oh, it doesn't sound right, but that's exactly what's happened. Hey, Lynn, thanks for letting me know you're here. I always appreciate it when people tell me when they come in. That way I know who's here. And you know, when I go home, Laurie's going to ask, who came to the Bible study? And I have to go, because I'm too busy teaching to memorize it, I have to go back to the Bible study on on uh, Facebook and look to see who makes comments. So thanks for letting me know. It helps her to know about what we're doing. Therefore, be patient, brother, until the coming of the Lord and see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, <coughs> waiting patiently for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. Good evening, Michael Newman. The, um, the word patient comes from a Greek word, and I'm just going to paste that word here because I might actually injure myself trying to say it because I can't speak Greek. I think I might actually be able to say this one, but I'd much rather paste it. Okay. Macrothumeo, something like that. It means to endure patiently as opposed to losing faith or giving up. But it, it can also mean to tarry or to, dis, to delay. So I want, I want to paste the, and the, the a quote from the Complete Word Study Dictionary, one of my many resources that I use, as it speaks about this Greek word. Macrothumeo involves exercising understanding and patience towards people, while the word hupomeno, which is the Greek 52, 6, 78 in the Strong's, involves putting up with things or circumstances. So it's a little bit different. Can you see the attitude difference? Macrothumeo is patient and understanding. Um, Hupomeno is putting up with things is irritated. It has to do with irritated, putting up with things, circumstances of people. <clears throat> James is telling the original readers and us to be patient with one another. Then he uses the oh so familiar example of a farmer waiting patiently for his crops to grow and become ready to harvest. He uses an interesting term. He says, until it receives the early and the latter rain. So I went to one of my favorite commentaries. He's been around a long time, Adam Clark. And I went there for insight about this term because Mike McInerney is not a farmer. So I don't know what a latter rain and a, a former rain is all about. I know a little bit, but I wanted to really communicate it so that we could all know more about what he's talking about here. James is talking to people who know exactly what that means because a lot of them are agrarian. <clears throat> by that I mean they live off the land by growing crops or they live off the land by, by um, grazing sheep or goats or something. And, and that all depends on, you know, something growing, some food to grow for, vegetation. So this is what Adam Clark had to say about it. He said, the rain of seed time, the planting, and the rain of ripening before harvest, the first fell in Judea about the beginning of November, after the seed was sown. So they would sow the seeds in November, that was their growing season, 
and the second rain came towards the end of April when the ears were filling up. So whatever was growing, wheat or corn or whatever was growing, and this prepared for a full harvest. So the idea was to not harvest early, let it get a chance to grow more. <clears throat> Thus God has promised, I will give you the rain on your land in due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest har gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. So so it's it's the food you can crunch with your teeth and eat. It was wine that was growing, so grapes. It was oil coming from olives, Deuteronomy 11:14. But for these, they were not only to wait patiently, but also to pray. I ask ye of the Lord in the time of the latter rain, so that so shall the Lord make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. And that comes from Zechariah 10:11. So they're constantly aware of this. The point James makes is that just as the farmers can count on the needed rains coming every single year in their timing, we can also depend on the Lord who is so consistent that it is he who designated when the early and latter rain would come like clockwork. When, is it, when it is explained as plainly as that, doesn't worshiping some clay statue of a pagan fertility god seem extraordinarily foolish? It just seems ridiculous. But that's what most people in those days did outside of Israel. They were worshiping gods that you can actually make with your own hands. Clay and wood porcelain, something that could break, something that was man-made, something that had no power whatsoever. And the same thing happens when we worship money and stuff and other people. It's extraordinarily foolish. So now we move on to James 5, 8. So he had just told them in seven, be patient like the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently. Now in verse eight, he says this. And remember, if you come in while we're talking, just say hello. And also, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to help me make this a really good study. In James 5, 8, you also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So James tells them to, using the farmer's patience as a model, also be patient. Next, the Holy Spirit through James advises them to be steadfast and unwavering in mind, strong and courageous. That's what the word establish your hearts means. Now, God wouldn't command this if it were not possible, no matter what is happening. And I've been up against some things that just seem to be way too much and overwhelming and unthinkable. <clears throat> and, and the dire consequences were daunting. And frankly, I didn't see how we can make it. And a lot of us have gone through things like that, especially after two years of a disease and all the fear mongering that went with it. It's easy to get overwhelmed. I personally have come to almost enjoy it when someone threatens me because it makes me want to laugh. I brought one of our brothers in a room there, someone physically threatened him the other day, and he just stood there grinning at him because he didn't care. The Lord is his shield and his buckler. And so I just kind of find it, it tickles me, you know, uh, when somebody's going to tell me what they're going to do to hurt our ministry or tell me what they're going to do to hurt my reputation. I don't have anything. 
You can't take anything away from me because everything I have belongs to the Lord. What is James's basis? I mean, if establish your heart means to be strong, unwavering, steadfast, and courageous, what is his basis on which we can place this courage? What, what is the basis for that courage? He says, it's for the coming of the Lord is at hand. <clears throat> now, some of the people that I watch over, pastor, shepherd, however you want to frame it, know that I have a term. And some of them have come to use that term uh, because they've learned to watch for God's hand. And the term is this. I'll, I'll paste it here. So if you if you if you um, want to, you can have it here. Very simplistic, but I think biblically sound. It goes like this. God is always up to something. In other words, we're aware of and we trust that God has a plan to rescue us. Now, frankly, as a human, I enjoy it more when I know what the plan is. I would love for him to send out a detailed summary of what he's fixing to do next. But also, Elena, at the same time, I think I've had a lot of great surprises from him where just you, you just wow and wonder that he did it again. But, but the fact is that we can trust that. He loves us. He has a plan for us. When, when uh, the psalmist writes this, he talks about that. And I appreciate that the psalmist will say, things are looking bad, you know. And then, and then he'll come in and, and he'll say something like this. <clears throat> I believe this is David. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. Miry clay is clay that sticks to you. If you ever got like in quicksand or something, grabs you and wants to hold on to you. Out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock on a place you can trust and establish my steps. He's put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud nor as turn aside to lies. I waited patiently for the Lord. When does he come? Exactly the right time. When does that feel normal? Never. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to enjoy waiting for it to be just the right time. Yet, that's my experience. And it's been my experience uh, watching the lives of others. You know, one of the cool things about the discipling process where you let somebody disciple you or you be discipled by someone or the pastoral relationship, and, and by saying that I mean the ones that actually utilize it, that actually let you know what's going on in their lives and let you be a part of their lives and let you give input, critique, um, rebuke, uh, praise, uh, all that, is that you get to see God at work in more lives than in just your own little life. I mean, I, I don't think really I see everything God does behind the scenes in my life because I think he's just huge, you know, and he's got so much that he accomplishes simultaneously all the time, all through history simultaneously. And as a human stuck in on a timeline, I really don't think I see it all. But I see some. And I'm more aware of it now than I ever was. And hopefully y'all will be too. We all will. But when you're a part of other lives, then you get to see him move on their behalf. You get to see him heal people. Body, soul, and spirit. You get to see him 
deliver people from the demonic. You get to see them uh, save people from being lost and put them on the road to heaven. It's just amazing, but you get to see more because you're involved in more, and that's one of the many reasons Satan doesn't want us to have anything to do with other people. He would have us hold up, cloister ourselves away, withhold ourselves from one another to protect ourselves from all the good stuff God wants to do in our lives. Wait patiently for the Lord. I'm grateful to all those who are in this room who let me watch over their soul. Some of y'all, it's been a, a, a few years. It's been a long time. So now in, in verse um, 9, James continues. Look at that. We rocked through. We finished with one verse. We already did eight. We are rolling now. Uh, in verse 9, he says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge, with the capital J, is standing at the door. So recently... I, I've been watching some TikTok videos for some entertainment, and I saw one in which two little dogs were expecting to get something, and the master tricked them. And when it turned out that neither of them got it, so the two dogs were wagging their tails, and they were, looked like they were smiling, and they were attentive, and they didn't get what they wanted, and, and their reaction was interesting to me. They immediately turned on one another and began rah, 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 attacking each other. They immediately began to growl and snarl and bite at one another. And when I read this verse, do not grumble against one another, brethren, unless you be condemned, <coughs> I remember those two little dogs attacking one another, taking their bitterness out on one another, and, and just going at whatever was closest. And I haven't noticed... And I have, and have you ever noticed how often I ask, have you ever noticed? I, I, I put that in a Facebook word this week. But I, I, the reason I do that is I think we live on autopilot. I don't think we pay attention. And we don't notice. And I, I just want to wake something up. I want to notice more. I want to see everything God wants me to see. But people that do that with the people that are closest to them. And they'll do it for two reasons. One, proximity. They're close. And two, they feel safe biting the people that are closest to them because they figure, well, they'll let me get away with it. Well, the truth is, if that was true, then there would be no divorces maybe, you know. But, but the reality is, is that people divide. Families fall apart because of stuff like this. Congregations fall apart. How do you think we got all these denominations and congregations littering the earth? It was because of that. People do this too. Satan loves to humiliate people and cause them to behave like animals. I love animals, but we're people. We're at the top of the food chain. When things don't go our way, we'll turn on our brothers and sisters, our spouses, our children's, our co-workers will kick the dog. We'll act like animals. We grumble. Now that comes from a Greek word, stenazo, S-T-E-N-A-Z-O. And I know A-Z-O <coughs> sounds like atzo, so stenazo. It means to groan, to sigh, or to grumble with impatience or ill humor. And I'll tell you, I am guilty of this one. Lord, fix that. I present myself to you to fix that. It comes from another word, which means narrow or, or contracted as one is when, it, when he is squeezed or oppressed by circumstances. So you ever get, you ever get that feeling that the whole life is crowding you in, or people are crowding you in. Or um, I was telling a guy earlier, I, I was doing some IRS stuff, because even if you have a, 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 a um, non-profit tax-exempt ministry, you have to 
turn in IRS reports. And the first half of this year with illness was kind of hellacious. So I'm coming down on the wire. So today I spent two or three hours putting that report together, you know, and I just, I had to struggle with the feeling that because I waited to the last minute, it was c compressing me. And I don't like working under pressure. I'd much rather do things early and in a timely manner and get it out of the way. And I'm feeling relieved because when I go home, I'm going to email that off to my accountant and I'll have that done with for the year. But that's what happens. We grumble because we let temporary earthly pressures control our souls. And when we do, the pressures become the boss of us. So what does that look like? Well, I'll give you some of my favorite ones. <laughs> Eye rolling, deep sighs, impatient facial gestures, slapping the forehead, door slamming, grunts, these are all manipulative behaviors which indicate that we're controlled by the actions or thoughts of other people or circumstances. I'm, so, I'm writing myself a note. Stop doing these things. <laughs> No, I made a mistake in my text and I'm fixing it. You know, some of these some of these studies become books. One of them is on Facebook. I'm mean, on Amazon right now. Uh, I'll do a shameless plug at the end of the study. <laughs> um, but maybe I won't. Um, Um, it says, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. When we do these things, those are judgments. In other words, someone else is not measuring up. And for that to be true, we have to become... Thank you, Megan. Uh, to do that, we become the standard. We become the standard instead of God or God's word. So we issue the judgment, and God cannot let this stand. After all, he is the judge. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. I, I really hope, you know, Kevin, I, I really enjoy face-to-face -face teaching more than anything. So where we can get interactions and, and people can can uh, be a part of it. I, I, I taught in a classroom in a, a church building for many years. This is the best I have right now. I wish there was an interactive way to do one of these Bible studies. But I love I love the Facebook medium because so many people are on it. Well, I want I want studies and actually every article I write and the books that I write. I want. I want you. I want a person to read it, and it be like I'm having a conversation with you, um, because I enjoy when I am at a Bible study, and it's that. It's not some canned thing that someone's reading off of some prepared uh, manuscript that someone somewhere else in another galaxy printed, right? So I want. I want. I, I actually think. I think we deserve something fresh. I don't think we deserve to have leftovers all the time. Um, I'll just say this. I did a funeral on Saturday for a lady I've never met. I met, I had met her, her husband. I had met her uh, before he was her husband. I had met her stepdaughter and some other family members. But I never, I never met her but then I was called to do her funeral. And um, I wrote a fresh, brand new funeral. Nothing's ever been done like it because I think she deserved that. I think it's important. 
Megan, I appreciate you saying that. Um, unfortunately, the version you have is chock full of typos. I actually have the file for that already, and you reminded me um, that I have a friend in St. Louis that I'm going to send it to and pay to to go through it and uh, find my t find my mistakes. And then I think I'm going to release that to um, print on demand, like I did with the uh, Ephesians book uh, for Amazon, uh, because it's already written. And then after that, I'll probably do Philemon. I'm, I think I'm going to do them all, every one of these. <coughs> um, but I'm off task. So when we do this, when we make these facial gestures, um, and we make these things, we're making judgments. Ha, okay, I'll send you a signed one. Um, we're becoming like the standard instead of God, and we're actually bumping him off the throne for judging other people's behaviors. Um, James is probably remembering something that Jesus said about this topic. He says this, and this is a, a, a misused verse in a lot of ways. Judge not that you would not be judged. Um, for you, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, I just want to say for all the people who misquote this, because like if if um if you mention that what a person is doing is illegal, or sinful, or unethical, or deception, or wrong, or whatever, they they often will come back with this verse because they don't know what they're talking about, and they will say you can't judge me because the Bible says you can't. This is not evaluating something to be right or wrong. This is saying that someone is less than because they're doing something. Good or wrong, that you disagree with or you agree with. So let's see what one major commentator has to say about this. The command... This is out of Albert Barnes's notes on the Bible. These are all well-respected commentators that I have in my Bible program. I also have a lot of these on my bookshelf. It's much easier to copy and paste off my Bible program. Um, this comment, this command, <coughs> refers to rash, censorious. Censorious means that we. We try to censor someone else's behavior by doing it. An unjust judgment. See Romans 2.1. Luke 6.37 explains it in the sense of condemning. Christ does not condemn judging as a magistrate for that when according to justice it's lawful and necessary. Nor does he condemn our forming an opinion <coughs> of the conduct of others for it is impossible not to form an opinion of conduct that we do not that we know to be evil. I mean, face it, if we know it's wrong, we're going to have a thought about it. But what he refers to is a habit of forming a judgment hastily, harshly, and without an allowance for every palliating circumstance. So in other words, without allowing for circumstances that are understandable even if it's still wrong. And the habit of expressing such an opinion harshly and unnecessarily when formed. Personally, I prefer to never weigh in on it unless I have permission to. And sometimes I'll ask. And often I'll get the no thank you and I just keep moving. It refers, it rather refers to private judgment than judicial and perhaps primarily to the customs of the scribes and the Pharisees. I pasted that because there's a mouthful there. The thing about judging like this, and we've all done this, is that it reveals 
what matters to us more than the Lord does. In time, the judge will deal with us individually about this. What do I mean by that? I mean that the, the Lord has told us to love him and to love one another. But if I'm willing to destroy another person because I disagree with them, then I'm showing that when it comes to that matter, I don't care what Jesus thinks. What I care about is what Mike thinks. And if that's the case, he's going to have a word with me about that. And he's going to deal with it. <clears throat> so, so apparently what was happening for these people is they, they had been divided out and spread all over the place. And in their frustration, they occasionally were being bitter towards one another, were biting and devouring one another and doing all that. That reminds me of a scripture that's actually, frankly, kind of horrifying uh, in uh, Galatians chapter f 5. It says this, I'm quoting it off my Bible program now. And my copy paste is not behaving good. Okay. That took a couple of bits. Um, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And that's a pretty horrifying concept. He's talking about cannibalism of one another's souls. I've seen this happen in marriages a lot. I've seen it happening. I've seen it happen in board of directors meetings, on church staffs. I've seen it happen, and obviously in the other, the the regular business world, away from the institution of the church. I've seen it happen uh, on on teams. I've seen it happen among friends. That we bite and devour one another. So just as we close, let's just think about this. <clears throat> Rough times are happening. They've always happened, and they always will happen. In this case, people have been driven away from their home in Jerusalem out to the outer reaches of the Roman Empire. These are Jewish brothers and sisters who are Christian brothers and sisters. And Satan has spread them all over the place. And sometimes... The very same Satan who tormented them got them to eat each other up. Think about it. Someone goes to the hospital. Someone has a car wreck. Someone uh, loses their job. Someone um, is going through a breakup. <clears throat> and we start eating each other's face. Hey, Jennifer, it's good to see you. Um, but, but that's what happens often, is that in the crunch, when we really need to set aside all of our little problems and take care of one another, we eat each other instead. We have to be wiser than that. We have to be aware that we're actually helping the devil to hurt one another and ourselves when we do that. Let's be wise as serpents. Let's be gentle as dove. Let's take care of one another. Let's love one another. And if we look around, there's plenty of opportunity to accomplish that. All right. So I'm going to uh, um, look up my book name so I can do my shameless plug.
Let's see if I can find that. Aha! There she blows. Okay. Um, this is my shameless plug. I hardly ever do this. But there are some people who um, enjoy the writing. So um, we're going to close up in prayer. If you if you go to this link, you can get that. Uh, I don't know, um, uh, Megan, if you have a copy of that. If you don't, I'll sign you a copy and mail it to you. I have some extras. Um, it's the first one I've published through Amazon as a print on demand book. You have that? Um, I also have one on Proverbs, um, 31 Days of Proverbs, uh, which is an ebook, an ebook, and you can get that too. So we're going to be working on more of that this year. I have energy, and uh, I'll get that to you, Megan. Um, just. Uh, Private message me your mailing address. I'll make sure I have it. Um, we're going to close. So, Father, I thank you for those who take time out of their busy lives to be a part of the study, whether it be live here on Facebook um, or on YouTube later or um, sometime later as they drive down the road. Father, I thank you that there are some people who just listen to them as if they were uh, audio files. I appreciate that people take the time, want to do it, and, and are hungry for your word. Father, today I, frust I, I, I express my frustration at the lack of disciples that there are on the earth in the church today. Whereas back when they was, were picking deacons, um, the amount of disciples was, were, were, was exploding on a day-to-day -day basis they hardly exist now. So I thank you for anyone who wants to study your word. And I praise you for that. And I ask you to stoke a desire for more out of people in, in the scriptures and in you. <clears throat> like Paul said, I want to know Christ. And the only way I know to do that is to hang out with them and to spend time with his people and to read his word. So I ask you to do that, Father. I ask you to bless all those that are here. Father Jennifer, uh, Broke both her feet this weekend. I ask you to heal her, give her pain relief. I pray <clears throat> that her recovery goes astoundingly fast and completely. And I ask you to bless her, Father. And I ask you to provide what she needs so she can do what she needs to do, even going to and from work. I ask you to bless her. And I thank you for these things. And I thank you for these people that I love who spend their time with us in Jesus' name. I also thank you that uh, my brother, um, that my br brother Kevin and his wife and, and their sons celebrated CJ's birthday yesterday. And I, I thank you so much that he had a good time. What a treasure he is on the earth. And I ask you to bless that young man as he moves into his adulthood. And I ask you to be with them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Um, uh, if if you go to this website, and you um, click on it, last Last week's Bible study will be there. And then later tonight, I'll be loading this one up, and it'll be there. If you like to read, or if you like to read what I write, and there's a few other authors there, go to this link, and there's over 260 articles there. Um, thank, you're welcome, Kevin. I think CJ's a delight. Um, if, if you go to that website... Um, the articles are there, and uh, I post them up there as I get them. I can't sit down and generate an article, but every now and then the Lord puts one out. Um, and so when, when he decides to do that, I sit down and write. He's had a real interesting um, 
season of thinking it's funny to make me wake up in the middle of the night to write. So, so that's what I've been doing. So um, God bless y'all. Thank you. Thank you for the interest and thank you for the kind words. I love you guys. I'll see you again next time. God bless you. Goodbye.